Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of EdNet 2013. Thank you for being in here this morning. We're going to, I uh, don't want to take any time away from this great keynote panel we had this morning. We know our colleagues are going to be wandering in, so we're going to go ahead and get started. The Industry Advisory Board this year was very interested, um, among other topics, in hearing from the big publishers in our community, kind of what's driving their business right now, what they see as the lay of the land, um, the challenges and opportunities they see. So um, I have been thrilled that we put together really um, an extraordinary panel this morning to, to bring that topic to you. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator of that panel, um, Rob Lytle with the Parthenon Group. You've heard him keynote for us before. He's, he's helped in planning. This is one of the smartest men I know and also very generous with his time and quite a bit of fun, too. He was looking at all of you way back there and kind of decided, if you decided to rush the stage, that they had some time to, to run. So uh, Anyway, you're in for a treat with this panel and with Rob moderating. I'll turn it over to him. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, welcome, everybody. And, and at any moment, please feel free to move further forward um, and uh, so we can see your faces. Um, we're going to try to walk through uh, what we hope is a fairly lively and spirited discussion today around what's going on in the K-12 landscape with an eye towards the digital area, but not necessarily purely digital. Um, and uh, then we're going to leave hopefully a lot of time for Q&A. So start thinking now of the questions that you actually want to ask of the titans of the publishing world that are all up on the stage with me here. Um, just real quick by way of introduction, uh, starting the far end here is Jonathan Harbour. Um, Jonathan's the CEO of K-12 Technologies at Pearson, um, where they manage, uh, amongst other things, data on about 25 million students around the nation, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Uh, Jonathan came over to Pearson um, during their acquisition of SchoolNet, which he had uh, founded and led for many years. Um, and uh, has been an ed tech uh, entrepreneur and uh, reformer for, uh, for some time. So a lot of, uh, you know, kind of long-term perspectives that you can gain from him. Uh, sitting next to him is Peter Cohen. Uh, Peter is the, um, the, uh, recently the president of McGraw-Hill Education, but comes from a long line of education, um, education areas, uh, experiencing consumer services way back in the day with Sylvan Education, where he was for about 13 years, um, and then went over to Pearson for about five years, where he was the CEO of K-12. Um, and then coming further towards me is Mary Cullinane. Um, Mary is, uh, manages all of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's uh, product development um, and came to Houghton Mifflin from Microsoft, where I actually met her um, many years ago, um, where she drove, pardon? Not too many. Not too many. <laughs> a scant two or three years, probably, topside. Um, and where she drove a lot of things, but one of them, and I think uh, you might be familiar with, is the School of the Future project. Um, in Philadelphia, which she was uh, responsible for sometimes. She's a former educator. And uh, my quick shout out to Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which is just a cool little statistic, is that about 50% of students learn to read uh, with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt products um, throughout the nation. We'll get a shout out to the other companies as well as we go along here. Um, and then finally, sitting right next to me is Median Curland. Um, he's the SVP of Technology and Development for Scholastic Education. But I think he holds the unique distinction of having been at the very first EdNet conference in 1989 um, and has been to, I think you said, practically every one since then. So we're going to let you miss one at some point. Yeah. <laughs> at some point. Um, for the, he bounced around a, a number of different areas as an education technology person um, and crossed over to the publishers about 13 years ago where he's been at Scholastic's uh, technology teams responsible for core instruction assessment on all of the iconic brands you're familiar with, Read 180, Math 180, uh, Scholastic Reading and Fast Math. Um, so those are our panelists, and, and like I said, please think of the questions you'd love to ask them. We're going to try to pilot through a couple of different, you know, issues that we think are boiling around in the K-12 landscape, but uh, then we'll turn it over and let you. Before we do it, I wanted to start with a little bit of context, which is, you know, what's going on at the macro level in K-12? Um, and I think, you know, as you think about it, um, times have been tough out there in terms of funding. Um, the Great Recession may be abating a bit, but I don't think any of us would raise our hand and say that we're seeing relief um, in funding in school districts. Um, remember, they're funded by state and local districts that even as the economy recovers, those tend to lag. Um, education, despite the rhetoric from politicians, continues to be a discretionary spend. And when you just look at state and local budgets, um, non-discretionary items like pensions and health care occupy a greater percentage of the budget year after year. So from our perspective, Parthenon's perspective at least, we don't see much relief in K-12 education funding for some time into the future. Um, and we expect that it's going to be reasonably tough to sell out there. Um, secondly is, you know, 
even if you, if you take the landscape of a tough environment, there have been a lot of interesting things. The, the plethora of ed tech companies that have exploded in the last couple of years and the amount of funding that are going into it would at least give you an indication that there's some hope out there that new pathways and new solutions might be being used. We did some research over the uh, late spring and early summer and, and found very clearly that teachers, district administrators, superintendents were actually starting to view educational technology and digital solutions in a slightly different way than they have in the past. Um, using them in the classroom, uh, expressing very clearly that they want to use more of it into the future. And I think very tellingly we saw when, when posed, when, when asked very directly, superintendents when asked directly, when they think about improving outcomes in the classroom, whether they'd rather put more money behind lowering the class side, so hiring more teachers, or putting their money behind ed tech solutions in an effort to increase performance in the classroom, they pick overwhelmingly ed tech solutions, which I think is a reversal of a trend that's been going on for the last 15 or 20 years, and an interesting one in the marketplace. So that's a little bit, you know, you've got budgetary challenges, persistence gaps continue to stay out there, we've got Common Core coming along, we've got a lot of stressors on the system, um, and I thought, you know, I, I might start off by just asking Peter Yu um, around some of the issues here. Tell me what's going on with some of the stressors, how Common Core is impacting the way decisions are making, how the transition to digital, and what you see changing out there right now. Everything. <laughs> uh, everything and nothing. <clears throat> uh, Common Core, as everybody knows, is, you know, impacting somewhere between 35 and 47 states, depending on the day of the week. Um, Common Core is just the next generation of standards, and we've had standards forever. So the great thing about Common Core is that it's a new set of standards, which means a new set of uh, instruction, a new set of curriculum, a new set of training, a new set of assessments. All that's good for the industry because we have a chance to, you know, provide those services back to schools. Um, Common Core by itself, you know, won't change anything. It'll be about the implementation. It'll be about what we assess at the end of the day. Uh, out of all the Common Core standards, just like every other prior assessment, you have to pick those that you're going to select to assess at the end of the period and how much weight you're going to give to each one. So the Common Core by itself, I think, is uh, it's a great start on a new set of standards, uh, and I think they have the potential to make us more competitive on a global scale, but the implementation and the decisions around what we decide to focus on will really impact what happens. I think. Probably the most significant impact for Common Core in terms of at least our business is the giant sucking sound that you hear around everything except literacy and numeracy. So, you know, if you're trying to sell a science program or a social studies program or an arts program, there's no funding available. All the funding is going to update uh, reading programs and math programs. So, in a way, that's good. Uh, in a way, it's kind of tough for the rest of the disciplines which I think schools should have a, a rounded uh, approach to delivering against those standards and not just measuring the literacy and numeracy standards. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll let some other folks talk, but that's kind of a starting mm -hmm. point on what Common Core is doing. Maybe? I, I agree with, I always agree with everything that Peter says. I think that... Um, don't you have an original thought of your own? I Come don't. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I think the challenge, as always, I, we should have more history majors in this space, I think, because if you look back at what we have been through from an industry perspective, we've, this, we've played this song. You know, we've had this story before, whether it was NCLB or whether it was um, any other initiative or new blip in the timeline of education reform, it has always struggled at the implementation level, traditionally, and this will be no different. And so that's been a little bit of frustration at the level of debate and the level of noise that has been so focused on the what of Common Core and not enough focused on the how. And so when, you know, for us, when we're taking a step back, we obviously have to address the what. And from a business perspective, um, clearly there's opportunity there. But for it to have the impact that we want it to have in the classroom, we need a little bit more focus on the how. Mm -hmm. So uh, you wanted to... Uh controversy, so I'm supposed to start every sentence with, I completely disagree. Um, so I completely disagree. And that would be true with you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, I don't think Common Core is just another set of standards. I think Common Core is a fundamental change in uh, the way we view standards. First of all, they're common, uh, which, is, which is new. Um, it uh, 
calls for a, a completely different way of actually delivering instruction in the classroom. Um, it's tied to new common assessments. Those common assessments are, are completely changing the mix of um, authentic tasks, the type of, uh, the, the, the ways that assessments will be done, which will lead back to the way curriculum um, is delivered. And a real big one is that the Common Core Assessment Consortia are going to require online assessment, which is going to, and, and we've already seen, start to fuel the uh, proliferation of digital uh, access uh, for kids because districts are trying to gear up to make sure that they're able to actually take Common Core assessments online. So um, I think, uh, again, if you're looking for, uh, for waves and trends, um, the proliferation of devices, in particular tablets, um, um, we've already started to see um, uh, kick in. I think that's going to be accelerated by these Common Core assessments. Um, I think that um, the whole modality of instruction as the bar is raised to college career readiness, you know, we've already seen the, the first states that have come out with uh, early Common Core assessments immediately, you know, uh, where there were 60, 70, 80 percent of kids proficient now, all of a sudden they're 20, 30, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to drive a whole new way of rethinking um, uh, uh, School improvement, uh, which is going to drive. So could, Jonathan, does that drive a whole new way of thinking about it, or does that actually blow up the assessments on people? That, you know, if you look at the difference between proficiency levels and, say, a Texas and NAEP proficiency level, you look at what happened in New York, um, where they actually have very strong standards to begin with, you see these 30 to 60 to 70 percent drops in the percentage of students that are proficient. You could, if, if we went to a common cut score, um, you could have entire districts, perhaps, where there's not a single proficient student. Um, do you think it survives that type of political pressure, or does it create cracks in the, uh, in the cohesion around a common cut score? Well, uh, the, I, I haven't seen any move for common cut score. There, there's common assessments. Uh, whether or not the states will adopt common cut scores is different. But I do believe there's a genuine refocus on what college and career readiness mm -hmm. is and that we've been lying to our kids. Um, and more of a focus on how we benchmark the PISA and international standards. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be harder to set arbitrary uh, cut scores. Um, uh, so I think there are going to be political legs around the focus on college career readiness. Um, you know, like any new assessment, you'll see it starts lower and creeps mm -hmm. up over time as, as folks get more used to the test, and there's going to be political uh, challenges for people to stick with it. But um, you know, so far, we're seeing that uh, you know both the Fed and, and the states that have adopted it are uh, are sticking with it. They're they're messaging beforehand these scores are going to be lower. Um, so I think there's going to be some longevity. Betty, uh, to just uh, spin off of what Jonathan just said, I I think one thing that's changed is the districts are finally on to us. Uh, I remember back when the first standards of modern standards came out, the NCTM standards in the late 80s, the industry's response was to quickly produce a whole lot of stickers that said aligned to NCTM standards for all of the uh, books and the booths. And that, and in fact, it was just amazing, the old, old math curriculums that had been specifically attacked by the standards, NCTM, were the ones that all got, uh, got the stickers. This time around, uh, districts are, are being uh, much more aggressive than we've seen in the past about saying, look, we like your curriculum, but we want something that was written for the, the, the Common Core Standards, not, not stickered. Because uh, as we learned from the past iterations, anything can be aligned to anything. I hope Michael Jay is not in the audience. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's, um, uh, but the, uh, we had done a, a, um, a, a full, middle school um, language arts curriculum just a couple uh, years back, uh, Expert 21, around, uh, remember 21st century skills? Oh, yeah, that's another one. Uh, uh, yeah, so I much. like to call them liberal arts education skills. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that program was, in fact, very, very common core. But uh, in places like New York City, they said, no, we don't want anything uh, that predates uh, whatever the, the official start date of Common Core. So uh, in no time at all, we produce a completely new three-year Common Core language arts curriculum. And, it's, uh, and we're seeing that in 
the adoptions in the big districts there, and the, the scrutiny that the, the customers are putting our materials through to make sure we're not just um, mm -hmm. uh, bringing retreaded old stuff. Uh, the other part that's really, it, it's long been a tradition in Scholastic, but we're even taking it to the next level or two, which is the need to embed the professional development everywhere in the, the student materials and the, the packages. The, uh, just doing a workshop on Common Core obviously uh, isn't adequate for getting schools ready. They want to see when they're buying our materials now that it's not only solid instructional material, but the heavy, heavy emphasis on scaffolding the teachers to be able to actually teach the new, in new ways, uh, and particularly in, in uh, well, both language arts and math, the, the extent to which the standards really push different teaching practices, not just different content or different sequencing, is causing massive ripples in how we think about structuring and producing the materials and how we have to sit down with our customers and talk to them about them now. So it, it's, um, uh, quite, Common Core is a lot bigger than 21st century skills. Mary, are you seeing that as well, that, you know, this is, that the level of scrutiny that's coming from the districts around Common Core is higher? Uh, yeah, I think a couple of things. One, I think the common of Common Core is a little bit of a fallacy, first of all, because you, the reality is Common Core only gets you in Florida or California or some of the other states about 80% there with, the, mm -hmm. with regards to the type of content that they're looking for. So we, we are not able to just produce one program or one resource and, and that's all we have to do. That's not the case. So it's kind of Common Core. That should be its new title. Um, the other thing that I think we're starting to see is there is, great, there is greater scrutiny, but the level of consistency of that scrutiny is absent. So because the level of understanding of Common Core, there's also great elasticity to that. And so while what gets identified as being aligned over here, I guarantee you I could take it to another person within that district or within that state and ask them to review the same piece of content and they'd be like, yeah, no, not so much. And so that is, that's a big challenge with regards to efficiencies, what it's supposed to be gaining in that regard, and our ability to, to, to react to an ever-changing marketplace. Mm -hmm. David? Um, I can't believe I'm going to agree with you after you agree with me <laughs> in general. The, the standards, and so Jonathan, well, do You'll a little bit counterpoint to your point. <laughs> You know, the standards that we had in the 50 states before this were largely around for math, uh, the National Council of Teachers of Math, for reading around the IRA, for science there around the science uh, organizations. And we built curriculum for each of those sets of standards, and lo and behold, they were about 80% common. Yeah. And the new standards <laughs> are about 80% common. The new standards are different. They, I think they are better. They are more aligned to what we're looking for at college readiness, so I think they are better standards. Uh, but bear in mind that, you know, these standards haven't been tested. We don't know if they really will be well aligned to college. Um, so it's a great starting point, but they're not set in stone. I think the year after this and the year after that, the standards will start to morph. Uh, you've seen states already start to devolve a little bit yep. from 100% to 80%. Yep. You've seen on the testing consortia, you know, PARC is, I won't say it's falling apart, but it could lose 10 of its states pretty quickly and it's already lost a couple with uh, Oklahoma and Florida and more that I've heard about in the wings looking for kind of an alternative approach to assessment. So we won't have a common assessment against the non-common standards. So it'll be back, I think, more to what states are looking for, which is kind of control over the standards in their states and a kind of higher bar for everybody. I think the higher bar is great. Um, I'm glad that we have a higher bar. Uh, and I think to Jonathan's point, it creates a great opportunity for us because if they do go to a cut, store, cut score, you know, we will have probably 70% failure against that cut score because if we're teaching similar to the way we have in the past and you raise the bar by 30%, 30% more kids are going to fail. Um, I don't believe we have the political will. Now, I'd be thrilled and excited if we did, but I don't think we do, um, to go to a cut score and have every state kind of accept that. Uh, I hope that we don't go where we did with NCLB, which is give people a 12-year runway and have everybody wait till year 11 or 12 to say, now let's raise the bar. Right. If we do, then Slope we'll have up like nothing. That. Yeah. yeah. So 
Uh, I think we have a better shot at this, and I think there is more focus around right. let's get there quickly. Uh, but it's you know, still going to be a state-by-state -state game. So let me follow up on this the, you know, common core versus common-esque core for a minute. Because, Peter, you, you said something that has, has long been a reality of, of, the, um, of, the, of the publishing business, particularly the Basel publishing business, which is a universal standard database, which is all four of you had, um, was about 75 80% common across states, right? So able to design a curriculum. And it was actually it was very expensive to maintain that universal standards database. You know, we're talking about barriers to entry before. It was actually one of the core barriers to entry that allowed the big publishers, the, the kind of the heft, if you will, to work across 50 states. And, you know, I would presume most of the folks out in the audience are smaller publishers or service companies and didn't necessarily have the resources to be able to map against 50 state standards. Peter, what you're saying is it sounds like Common Core is starting to move more in the direction of the old one, although maybe the standards at the core are more clearly standard, right? So they're coded the same way and tagged the same way um, and maybe better than the previous ones. But do you see it devolving so much that in order to compete across 50 states, you're going to have to have reasonably separate sets of material, or is it going to be able to do it with supplemental or digital standby products? So, so this kind of goes to the question of what schools are looking for mm -hmm. on the output side. On the input side, I do think the playing field gets much more level because of the advent of technology. So we can all create databases where we can align individual learning objects and individual uh, items to a set of standards which you can then correlate to each state and almost anybody can do that. And there's a bunch of service companies here that will help you make that alignment. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, anybody in the room could easily create a state-by-state -state specific set of resources by pulling out those that are aligned for that state. Uh, I think the benefit that the, the group up here probably has compared to many of the people in the room is, is a couple of fold. Um, one, while we'd love to be all digital, and we'd love everybody to be all digital, uh, and I know Karen told me, you know, we should only talk about showcase stories and not talk about the challenges districts are facing in going all digital. Um, there are very few all digital districts, and there are some good reasons for that. Uh, you know, embarrassingly, I'll, I'll pick on my own company for a second. We had an all digital installation of a program that just occurred at the beginning of the school year uh, for uh, thousands of students in a, in a reading program. And two weeks in the program, they said, you know, the books aren't downloading fast enough on the programs. We're having trouble with bandwidth. Can you send us a class set of every program? Um, I was involved in one for a former company we won't name, but this guy worked for that company today. Um, <laughs> and we did a large installation in Huntsville, Alabama, you know, uh, digital across every district, uh, across every program. And before school started, we ended up putting a print version of every single program in that school. So. The requirement for a blended program by most districts today gives us an advantage. We have manufacturing, we have warehouses, we have global sourcing, you know, we've done that for a living, and we have economies of scale. And it's hard for folks who are purely digital to gain that economy of scale. So a blended environment probably still benefits us versus the smaller players, but there's no question the growth category is digital and all digital. So those people who are playing on the digital side um, they're going to continue to get more and more market share starting from a very small base. So it's not that it's not a great place to be, uh, but I think we probably represent, I was kind of adding this up, about $4.5 billion worth of revenue in K-12, the group up here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wouldn't ask everybody their percentage, but if I ask everybody sort of how much of that has no print component to it, you know, you'd still be close to $4.5 billion uh, in terms of having a print component. So I, yeah. I, it's changing, but it's not changing as rapidly as everybody was. So that, that's a great point because when you look across kind of the the, the, the sub verticals within you know products and services, some of them have clearly gone virtually all digital. Like if you have a test prep, um, hard to sell test prep if it's not digital. Um, but your, your point on the blended is actually a very interesting one. That you know, no matter how much desire there may be to go digital, sometimes there's practical considerations that make a blended program the reality. I'd love to get perspectives from the rest of you, Vidya. Well, one somewhat alarming trend that we, we have to watch, uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier this new Common Core uh, language arts curriculum we produce largely at the request of one of the largest school districts. Uh, and they requested it be all print because they just knew for a core uh, language arts program they didn't have the infrastructure to um, to go all digital, so we did an all print. Uh, and very late in the, the game, I 
a month before this uh, project was due, they said, oh, and by the way, we want a digital copy of all the materials as well. And the, their assumption was, you've got the print, the digital's trivial, we, we don't want to pay for it, we want you to just throw it in the box. And then of course, well, now we don't want just PDFs, we want it to have some interactivity and we want, and before long, so we now have a full Common Core line print and digital uh, offering, so great, we have a blended product. But the perception is that the digital it should be, if not free, a whole lot cheaper. And we try to explain, actually, the print's what's cheap. We can send those <laughs> books over to China and they can churn them out for next to nothing. The digital, we got servers, we got SLAs, we got all, all kinds of uh, upkeep, maintenance, bug fixing. And so, the same is true from a district's perspective, by the way. Yeah. Right, so so it, it, it's a funny time we're in now. I, you know, the forcing function from Common Core and from tablets I, it ultimately is very healthy, but we're in an odd moment where the perception of where the costs are and uh, what, what should cost what and what should be cheaper than what and what can be thrown in as the freeze in, uh, in an adoption or uh, just a district-wide sale. So it's a, it's a funny, distorted reality we're in right now for this period, however long it's going to last. I think part of what we're seeing, you know, nobody wants to buy the cell phone right before the new one's coming out, right? Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to get the version six months before the new version's going to be released. And there is this market energy right now around superintendents or school boards or curriculum directors who they, they hear what's coming. They hear about the possibilities of digital. They hear about personalized learning. They hear about data-driven instruction. They hear about the wonders that will, will come into their classrooms and into their districts. And they want to ensure that the folks that they're talking with, the folks that they're going to invest in, the folks who they're going to, they're going to partner with, will, will lead them into that future. And so you have to be able, A, you, you, you better be there. You better have a reality around that story. You better recognize it. You better be able to deliver it. You better have an opinion on it. You better be able to, to demonstrate it. But then at the reality of implementation, that's not where they are. And so you have this tension of, I got to know the partner that I'm going with can take me into the future, but they also have to be able to deal with my present. Mm -hmm. That is a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous challenge for any business when you have to have almost two engines simultaneously working at the same time and delivering incredibly high quality materials. Um, and yet, at the implementation level, there's probably a different state of reality that you're reacting to. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> disagreement. Again, I, I, disagreement I, I, only. I'm sorry? You, disagreement. You, got, you have to completely disagree. disagree. Uh, no, I, I think I have a little more radical view. I think um, uh, I, I believe Common Core is not just another standard. It's going to be a set of standards. It, it is a game changer in the way uh, we're going to be looking at instruction. Um, I think tablets is not just another. Um, it's not just an, another PC that we think all of a sudden is going to be cheaper. I think it is a game changer in the way uh, that people interact with uh, with uh, content and a price point where. We're actually starting to see what I would call a tipping point. I think Apple says they've had six million units already uh, in K-12. I don't know if everyone caught that Los Angeles has just uh, um, uh, passed a bond and they're buying 650,000. Can we just pause there? We're taking out debt to buy a consumer electronic device. Right. And we need keyboards now because they didn't think about that so, and they didn't. And the anyway, six, no, you know, 650,000 <laughs> iPads, one for every student. I mean, we, you, you, can, you can mock it, but these uh, are No, trends. nobody's mocking it uh, and nobody's disagreeing with you, but I think there's also well, a reality have to, to disagree. it. <laughs> um, um, and, um, uh, you know, remember, we, we talk a lot about ed tech in higher ed. We've always assumed the learner has a computer, so it's taken a hold and the internet access, at least for the last decade. You haven't been able to assume that in K-12, so that's really the question. Yeah. I, I believe you have to skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, um, and going back to Common Core, the rubber will hit the road with the assessments. Um, whether or not there are you know, 20% difference in standards from state to state, 
The real question is going to be if the assessments uh, uh, stick uh, and are uh, and pick up across the board. I think we'll see more acceleration. So let me ask a quick question on LA Unified. I'll use that as an example. Yep. Um, all jokes aside, keyboards, no keyboards, power cords. And by the way, I'm about to demonstrate uh, blended learning because I just got the battery dead message on my iPad here, which is going to be happening in LA Unified all over the place um, next year. It's great because all my notes are on here um, because I'm, I'm exactly that digital. Um, but LA Unified, uh, we get the pads out there. Um, is it a race and a competition amongst yourselves and everybody out here to get on the pad once it's installed in LA Unified, or does it evolve to a race to get on the pad before it's sold? And so how are we going to see those RFPs in the future? Is it, I want to buy a bunch of devices, or I want to buy a bunch of content-loaded devices? I'd just love to get your perspectives. I don't think there's a real answer out there yet. Well, we can look at LA as an answer. So the RFP was not, we, we need devices. The yeah. RFP was Common Core transformation Digital and content. Common Core devices, and it was actually a combination. So it's not just 650,000 iPads, it's 650,000 iPads with complete digital common core, mm -hmm. um, and they went out and looked for the best, uh, uh, the best solution. Yeah, who did they uh, find, Jonathan? I can't, can't remember <laughs> who they, they, they chose. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that every district will, will do that at the same time, and certainly, you know, we haven't really talked about, um, um, you know, moving from the, the warehouse and publishing being the uh, the distribution system to the ecosystem in the future and where the Googles and Apples and Amazons play. Um, so I think there'll be a combination of uh, districts going out for bring it all together, give us a solution, um, and once that solution is in play, there is an ecosystem which creates a mm -hmm. new digital marketplace. So I think both is the answer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of us chose not to participate in the uh, L.A. Um, RFP on the content side because the appearance was with all of those, that money that was being spent, the vast preponderance was going to go into device and device management, which again gave an unrealistic impression of the value of high quality content and curriculum. Uh, now, of course, you get some economies of scale with 650,000 devices, but still uh, for companies particularly like us with higher price specialty uh, products for the most part that aren't meant for every single kid on every single device. It was just a non-starter. So the, I think what we're seeing, and uh, Amplify is obviously an example of this, is trying to define a, a base layer of tools and content that can be for everyone, and then you start over again now. What are the point solutions? What are the specialty tools? What are the not for everybody but still needed by the district? software that will get layered on top of that. Yeah, I, no, that. Go ahead. Yeah. No? Oh, yeah. I'll just I think districts are getting smarter. Okay, uh, I do think that uh, we're approaching the age where you t like it, take a look at uh, groups like Jeb Bush's, the Alliance for Excellence in Education, that are talking to districts about the things you need to go digital and to improve education. And they're trying to help people remember that it's not about technology for technology's sake, which is how it started. You had people buying iPads, and to your point, you know, there are like six million out there. I'd be curious as to how many are used on a daily basis, center of class, and I'll bet it's in the low single to double digit percentages of those that are actually being used effectively in the classroom because it's not just the hardware, it's not just the bandwidth, it is the implementation, it is the training for teachers probably more than anything else, and it is software that runs on there that works in an ecosystem, and I know you guys are you know, creating one like that. Amplify's got one, and we have one in time to know where you can actually get a complete ecosystem mm -hmm. that still centers around the teacher and the teacher's importance and in instruction, but gives you a single working environment. And until we get to that point for schools that it is easy to use, um, teachers are gonna be frustrated with it for exactly the same reason, Rob, that you are frustrated. This you, last weekend, I couldn't get into my own network, yeah. and I spent three hours on the phone with the help desk, you know, and finally, somebody was able to figure out a simple solution of downloading yeah, I something. outsource that to my children. Right. They take care but, of that for me. But think about a school, and think about having 35 kids in front of you in a classroom, and you can't get two things to connect. You better punt pretty quickly. Well, it is. I mean, there are so many infrastructure. I remember, you know, one of my partners, Seth, help was involved in the early of a school of one in New York City, and the search for a physical building that could actually accommodate it was incredible. 
You know, it, it's one thing to have high bandwidth into the school, but I've got to have 30 kids download rich content at once. Um, I actually have to have power, right, to all the kids. And, you know, you can't just snake extension cords across there. There is an infrastructure element to a lot of this. Well, that's things. why the tablets actually are going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. I agree with Jonathan. The, the tablets have a 10-hour battery life. You can plug it in before you get to school. It'll last so all day. You should day. plug it in before you use it. Is that, yeah. That's the lesson there from you today. Go. Yeah. Wow. There's also the other challenge is if the bandwidth is hard to capture, you'll spend all your battery power trying to capture your bandwidth, and so <laughs> yeah. it will drain more quickly. So there still are some challenges, but I think that the tablet device, even if you have to buy a keyboard for it, is going to be the device of choice. And it is a game changer. It will change how we teach in the classroom, and teachers can move away from the front, can walk around mm -hmm. with students. But the, the implementation and the training for teachers about how to work in this new world is the critical element that if we don't do that well, all the technology in the world will not change our outcomes. And so, I, oh, go ahead, Mary. I think anybody who does not subscribe to the idea that, that we, were, we are going to see a critical shift in education with regards to the types of resources that they bring to bear to be successful is, has their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Let's get on to the next debate. We know that technology is going to continue to have an, an impact. We know that, especially with the changes that we're seeing from a, from a build of materials perspectives and the devices that partners are putting into the marketplace, that it's going to become easier. We know that broadband is going to continue to, to have, a, have an adjustment, and we're probably going to see some better outcomes there, hopefully, with different E-rate approaches. We're, we know all of that is, is, is coming. We know that there are early adopters in the marketplace who are demonstrating it today. We know all of that. The challenge that we have as an industry is what will be the timeline to scale. Mm -hmm. And that is really the debate, and, if, and, to, and that's what we, I think, have to focus on the nuances to that reality um, so that we don't once again become that technology industry that was just out there pushing, you know, all you need to do is go one-to-one -one and here's your device and yep. the world will be better. Can I come back to your chicken and egg or egg question? So your question essentially was, it, but will they buy the devices or will yeah. they buy uh, um, the, the curriculum and, uh, you know, certainly? And, and John, by the way, I think it's a relevant question for a lot of folks out here because if actually they're going to buy a device with a lot of content on it, it simplifies the sales and marketing solution for those who aren't at scale. One of the advantages that all of you have is you have a very large distribution arm in terms of a sales force to sell to districts. So if, if the world actually becomes a district buys devices and platforms that come with content, it really changes the selling dynamic where I don't necessarily have to go district to district. So right. I, it just, if you could corporately, I think that's a, a really interesting twist to this. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, I, I don't think it will be chicken. You're, you're, you're going to see different, uh, different modalities of procurement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see it all together, sometimes you won't. But I wanted to elevate it a little bit. I, I actually think where the opportunity of the market is headed, and I don't think anyone has grabbed that space yet, um, is more of the outcomes partner to the district, which is mm -hmm. uh, we'll figure it out for you. Um, we'll bring together the right uh, hardware, the right um, uh, curriculum, the right professional development. Uh, we'll focus on the outcomes with you and start to actually drive relationships that are focused on outcomes. Um, this is really complicated stuff. In other industries, it's outsourced to, to, to large companies who can actually mm -hmm. approach, uh, approach it from a holistic perspective. Um, so I agree, with it. without the right implementation, without the right professional development, without the right change management, these could just be devices that either have uh, content up front or later. Um, I think that's, a, that's an open territory is the whole uh, services and outcomes angle, which, uh, um, again, I, I think there are opportunities moving forward. So Great segue, actually, into this debate is, you know, if, if the performance gaps are real, if they're getting bigger um, because of the way we're going to start assessing, how much pressure is there on you to be accountable for the outcomes of the education as opposed to just the quality of the content and materials and services? You know, I, I think how much pressure is on us, not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely think that's our only reason for being in business. If we're not aligned to student success, if we're just pushing inputs to education and saying, well, that's the end of our job, move on, um, then we don't belong here. And if that's how you're focusing your businesses, um, you don't belong here either. There is a crying need for improved outcomes for student achievement and comparing us to other countries around the world that's kind of an economic and moral imperative. Uh, and we are focusing what we build now 
to be able to measure student success and be able to use technology to its best benefit, which is to change learning objects that don't work, mm -hmm. to adapt those learning objects to the learning style of that student, to give them learning objects that are at the zone of proximal development, right ready for that student. So the students are always learning something that's just on the edge of what they should be able to do, as opposed to having to guess or as opposed to having some predetermined linear scope and sequence that isn't right for every child. And if you're not building things that kind of say, how am I going to improve student achievement, then you know, you're probably not going to be in the market at some point in the future. Um, so I'm happy for the pressure. I embrace it. Uh, and we've got to do a lot of work to, to actually achieve that. But it's right on. And I, and I, I'll say we, we've certainly seen that when we put our products in a, in a district, obviously we want them to, quote, work. We want renewals. We want upsells. We want expansion. The, the issue that keeps coming up is, well, who, who can actually tell if something works? Well, who can pick? what you should be looking at, what are the outcome measures that would indicate, yes, this reading program works. So over the last 10 years, we've certainly switched from being primarily a, a product company to a services company. Uh, services uh, is um, our fastest growing, our, our second largest product to read 180. And a lot of those services uh, are data analytics and analysis that uh, our people who know the products the best go in working with the central office staff, collecting the data, analyzing the data, uh, presenting the data at board meetings to superintendents. Because on the, this notion, and you know, we've, we've been working with InBloom and others like that, that you can somehow sweep up all the data and aggregate it and aggregate it, and then meaning will just fall out of it. and, and uh, percolate back down to the classroom. That, that's a, a, you know, a lovely dream, but the, the amount of work that's going to have to be done, I mean, we are such at the infancy of understanding, learning, and the data that is being captured by the, the terabytes uh, in all of our devices, making sense of it, and being able to mm -hmm. do, do the kinds of actions you're talking about, Peter, in terms of true personalization. So the whole area of data, you know, the, all the big data problems of analyzing that data and making the right um, decisions based on it. I mean, I hope we get to the day where we don't look at the test scores and say it worked, it didn't work, but every day, all day, we're, you know, we collect more data today on a daily basis than all the standardized end of year test scores since the beginning of time uh, have accumulated. So. Uh, the real uh, goal is to get rid of the tests altogether because you're going to know everything all day, every day on how people are doing against a wide range of outcomes. And that whole area is just in its, in its infancy and it's going to take an awful lot of work by us, but it's also going to take an awful lot of work uh, that's been slow uh, to materialize from the uh, universities and research centers to um, partner better with the industry around the, the understanding of learning when, for the first time, we really have this embarrassment of riches with the, the tablets and the kinds of um, applications we're building and the way we're instrumenting them. So uh, it's, we're, it's not that we're drowning in a, in a, a sea of data. We're just, uh, you know, it's over there and it's just really untapped potential right now. But until we do, a lot of the rest of this stuff is going to stay you know, in, in the future and uh, uh, more of a, a dream than a reality. I, think, uh, I can touch a little bit on the way Pearson is looking at it. So, so for one, Pearson has developed uh, an internal what we call efficacy framework, um, which is essentially uh, measures any internal project that we look to uh, to fund both in terms of our capacity, what the clear goals are, and, and if there's a, a, a client involved, whether the client capacity is there to sort of put some measurement on it. Um, but this notion of efficacy, I see, and, and again, going back to the title, and I wasn't sure whether, the, whether it was big publishers are dead, big publishing is dead, there are barriers for entry, um, and it made me think of whether we are any of those. Um, so to some extent, if you're really in the outcomes and efficacy business, what you're also seeing uh, for, and I don't know if people know, Pearson owns K-12 schools around the globe. 
owns higher ed schools, both brick and mortar and virtual, uh, the, the largest teacher of direct instruction of English uh, on the planet, uh, China, India, uh, across the globe. So I think uh, part of being in the, the game of outcomes and efficacy is also rising up the ladder to uh, deliver more direct instruction. Um, so I'm not sure that I, and I would call Pearson a education company, not a publishing company. And yes, in many ways, we're looking at book publishing as a dying component of that business being replaced um, both by digital, but also services, as you say, and trying to elevate up so that either we're actually um, doing direct instruction around the globe or partnering with uh, government agencies um, to partner with them in terms of the outcomes of their instruction. And I think uh, to be able to piece together all of the components of curriculum instruction, professional development, assessment, at a technology at a scalable level, um, um, I think that probably will be the true way for taking outcomes accountability. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can walk away from customer expectations. You know, I think, and I think the expectations that the customers have of us uh, are high, and I agree, need to be higher. I believe that, you know, five, ten years ago, I worked at a technology company, and probably the expectation there of our customers was, did the computer turn on? Did the application work? And there was a much smaller subset of expectation for that customer set. I think now, um, with the conversations that we're having, the expectations are core to what they do. At the end of the day, they're going to be measured on a learning outcome. And the depth of the partnership that we have with these customers, we sign up to help them meet that expectation. Mm -hmm. And if you walk away from that, go ahead, but then you have no business being at the table. Let's, I'm going to use that perhaps clunkily to do a transition here. I like the analogy of, you know, technology company, does my computer turn on? Does the application work? Um, when I'm delivering educational content and services, it's more of, did you transform the child, right? Did you set them up for on a pathway for success in life? We've been talking a lot about school districts' expectations, but I'd be curious to get your perspectives on the rising role of the parent in all of this. We've now had charter schools for some time, um, where parents have choice in the schools they send them to. Uh, parent portals have been out for a while, but I think you're starting to see usage on parent portals start to really spike up. Um, all of us collectively have talked about the potential for consumer educational products for some time. Are you starting to see a different role of the parent um, in educational materials, either on their own buying directly or through, um, or through districts having influence in that way? Is, is something changing there relative to the last 20, 30 years? So I'll jump in, but before, uh, since you're transitioning, before jumping to parent, you, you uh, summarized as uh, the, the last discussion as technology uh, um, uh, directly uh, educating students. Uh, I think that's probably the wrong jump. Um, the teacher is a, a critical component. Mm -hmm. um, we have three and a half million in this country, um, and technology um, is not going to work on its own. I think most of these modalities which are going to work assume that there is an adult mm -hmm. uh, involved, and in many ways the adult is guiding the instruction, even if it happens to be digital. It just mm -hmm. happens to allow um, a, an adult to do um, uh, more differentiated, more personalized um, uh, learning with a, within their, their classroom, but to think that these devices are going to be uh, airlifted in um, and a, a bunch of kids are going to turn them on and all of a sudden become educated is probably the wrong, mm -hmm. wrong expectation. Um, so a teacher is still uh, a paramount front and center. With respect to parents, um, we probably have uh, more parent, parents logged into parent portals than, than I think anyone. Um, uh, one, just the, the, the notion of having uh, real-time data on your students. Uh, did they have homework? Uh, how did they do on their homework? What are their scores? Um, uh, we certainly hear parents talk about how that uh, uh, transformation of their relationship often with their student. Um, you know, again, power school, we have, uh, you, you can on your iPhone or, uh, or mobile device um, uh, really stay in touch with your, your, your child's education at all time. In terms of your question of extending that to purchasing, um, you know, I think there's always been a, uh, a, a parent market, uh, usually at the high end, whether it's test prep, uh, high end interventions, high end supplementals, or at young ages. Um, at young ages, parents tend to buy a lot for kids between the age of about zero and seven. After that, students kind of, or kids become their own 
uh, consumers. Um, so absolutely think a lot of that will transfer, again, from print to digital. Is there an opportunity through a parent portal to provide better data to inform uh, parents um, on those purchases? Yes. Um, is there an opportunity for a marketplace that's informed by that? Yes, but I don't see the overall category growing. Um, you know, I think the, the, the bulk of instruction is still going to come through uh, the institutions, would be my, my guess. So I'm thrilled I get to disagree with Jonathan. All right. Uh, thank you. Anytime. Uh, in, in terms of where parents are and kind of the consumerization of education, uh, if you look at a country like South Korea with its population, I actually don't know what it is, but it's relatively small compared to the United States, parents there spend more on education after school than parents in America, whatever X times the size we are. So I think we have nowhere to go but up in terms of parents spending money uh, on kids after school. And in, in a lot of Asian countries, there's a belief that it's a family responsibility to help educate kids, not just a school responsibility. And so they spend a significantly higher amount of their GDP on educating children than they do in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., it's about a $30 billion category of goods and services and uh, uh, consumer products for education. I think that could easily grow to $150 billion over time so if you compare it to other countries. Yeah, let me pause there because, you know, one interesting thing is when you go out and talk to parents about what they consider educational spend, you find that the American parent will consider a lot of things that you would superficially Sports say is not education. Camps. Yeah, camps, dance lessons, soccer, karate, I think they're right. educational I think they're training. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the the well-rounded <laughs> child, you know, is more than just studying yeah. for a math test. Yeah. And part of the reason you guys uh, saw a lot of one of your folks, folks yeah. was yeah. talking about Singapore, right, mm -hmm. yesterday, yeah. and talking about how now they're trying to figure out how they get their kids to be more creative yep. because they've focused everybody on just a few technical areas of competency as opposed to a well-rounded child with uh, what we call yeah. the did call it 21st century skills, but really, you know, kids who are comfortable in their skin and can collaborate and play mm -hmm. and think creatively and think critically, uh, and that parents do include that whole category. And I think they will continue to increase the spending on that. I do think that there's an opportunity from programs, whether it's the, the, the Pearson uh, Power School program or others, for parents to get much more engaged in what's available from school. And that, again, that category is almost zero today mm -hmm. in terms of uh, opportunities directed at parents through a portal that comes from their school. And there's, you know, all sorts of concern about are we trying to force parents to buy something and is that equitable for those right. kids who can't afford it, et cetera. So I think it'll be kind of a slow road, yeah. but I think it's going to happen. I think you de you know, what we're seeing clearly just at the social level is a balancing of informal learning time and traditional learning time. And as that as that experience contends, continues to play out, I think there is obviously growth space in the informal learning time, the opportunities that we're providing our kids outside of traditional hours. But I think that the nuance to that market is going to be in the early stages, those opportunities that help to bridge the experience between home and school, mm -hmm. as opposed to creating these separate one-off sh shoots outside of, of some continuity. Because I believe at the end of the day, Increasing that continuity of experience is best for the learner, um, as opposed to these, you know, completely divergent paths that offer unique opportunities in and of themselves. So I do think that that is an opportunity to think about from a market driver perspective. Um, but I, you know, I agree that we see, we see the parent um, becoming. Uh, voice becoming louder because of a myriad of reasons, whether they be social media or otherwise, we do see their voice getting louder. However, the reality in our urban districts, the reality in some of our challenged um, environments from an education perspective is every teacher today will still tell you, as I said, you know, 15 or so years ago when I was in the classroom, the parents who show up at teacher parent back to school night are not the parents that I wanted to see. And that's still the case. That is still the case today. And so those are the types of challenges that have not changed that we still need to be thinking about because, again, at scale, those are the things that are preventing us from being successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same point, really, but we, um, I think it's important for all of the, the publishers to uh, stay focused on this very large and important segment of the market. Uh, it's the kids we refer to as the school-dependent children. Uh, there are an awful lot of kids who, if it wasn't for school, they would really be in trouble. They get their meals there, they get their support there, they get safety there. Uh, as you say, it's the, there are more and more involved parents and all of that is good, but there's also 
this big segment and particularly in the intervention market, you're dealing with those, uh, those kids living in, in very difficult circumstances often. And one of the roles that uh, we, we feel we have as an industry is uh, to make sure we're not making assumptions about every kid with a, a new cell smartphone and access to broadband and, and parents who are going to participate with them uh, after school. So all of this is great, but let's not forget the, the role we have as publishers of looking after those school-dependent kids as well. And by the way, on this point, I actually hope Peter is right. So I'm, 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 I'm rooting for you. And, and certainly we see you know, in other countries where there are families that live on $2 a day that there are parents who are willing to um, uh, invest half of their daily income towards uh, education. Uh, I just don't believe. I'm not seeing it. I'm not sure that in the United States that there's going to be a higher proportion of disposable income from parents that they're going to shift from one thing into education. I certainly hope you're right, and we see that triple in size. And certainly around the globe, we see that in a tremendous way, often tied to private education or private education options, literally even in the, in the poorest communities in the world. Um, um, so I hope you're right. Good. Great. So at the very beginning of this, I painted a reasonably bleak picture of the K-12 environment. But all four of you are leading organizations that like to grow. Um, give me a quick bullet or point to, or to each of you and why you reject my kind of not so rosy outlook and, and why you think it's exciting to be in the K-12 landscape here in the US. Well, I'll go since everybody's looking around like, gee, what do I say to that? <laughs> uh, I think publishing is dead. And that if you think that you're a publisher in this room, um, you probably should look for you know, a new business model. Um, because I agree with you, Rob, that the outlook for publishing is dismal. I know that at least three companies up here, I can't speak for Scholastic because I don't know them that well, would not consider themselves publishers mm -hmm. and don't consider themselves publishers. They would consider themselves some form of digital learning solution providers. And I think that the opportunity for people who provide learning solutions for schools is incredible. And there's never been a better time to be in education than right now. We've got this wonderful convergence between you know, a, a public fury around the quality of education in America, the technology capabilities now that allow you to, except for you, know, you didn't plug it in in the morning, allow you to have a technical uh, dead. technology device that will last all day long that you could actually use for learning. <laughs> We're at the very early stages, I think, as you pointed out, on brain science, of really trying to figure out how kids learn mm -hmm. and what we do about it. And that, to me, by the way, is the area that the federal government should spend most of its money against, is trying to figure out how people learn, giving that information back to everybody in this room so we can use it to create programs that help kids learn better. Uh, but we are at such an early stage in all of this um, that everybody in this room has an opportunity to succeed. So I'm very bullish on both the industry, but I, I don't think publishing itself is a very yep. uh, good area. Yep. I completely agree. It's, you know, I'm new to this space of publishing, and I, I, I am flabbergasted by how, as an industry, we got cornered into being named by our distribution methodology. That's, that's not how an industry should be named, and that's not what we're, we're about. Uh, and so that has been very interesting for me, and I've reflected on that often the past year and a half. And I absolutely agree that no one up here considers themselves a publisher. As a, again, I'm an old history teacher, so history plays an important part in my thinking. We, we figure this stuff out as a country. That's what we've done time and time again. So to think all of a sudden that this curtain is coming down on the U.S. education system is absolutely ridiculous because it, from a historical perspective, there's been those blips where that should have been the case over the past 200 years and it's never happened, so it's not going to happen now. So let's forget that debate and let's move on. We've got tremendously smart folk who are thinking about how we can improve the teaching and learning process and it's only going to get better. We see a shift from an international perspective of those countries now looking to us because they're being challenged in the area of innovation and creativity. So there's going to be a, sh you know, it's these ebbs and flows that we see in this space that are incredibly frustrating. So now those, you know, we're going to see more attention and more energy around that. That is clearly something that we do better than anybody else in the world. And I think this, this perfect storm of, from a technical perspective, 
what we're able to do at a low cost, little barrier to entry environment, the social um, concerns that we're starting to see be elevated with a louder voice, and the economic imperative that we're driving towards, that thing coming together means this is a great space to be in. And anybody who thinks otherwise, I think is, I don't know, they didn't read the paper or something, they're missing the boat on this, because there's, there's just great upside in this space. And it's not about your delivery methodology, it's not about the fact that you used to sell great content in a book, it's about how are you going to figure out how to get great content and great learning outcomes into our classrooms. And I'd, I'd also add to that the, uh, the part of our industry that I, I think we really don't want to see go away. You know, fine, if the textbook that weighs 20 pounds is gone, who cares? Uh, who cares? Uh, I mean, we, we stopped doing textbooks uh, 13 years ago at, at Scholastic, but we do digital learning systems. And one of the things, though, that, that uh, I've seen so clearly in, in my time at Scholastic Anybody who thinks developing really good, effective curriculum is easy, <laughs> yeah. never tried it. Uh, when I watch our editorial team sitting around the table, bleeding over how to say something, what order to put concepts in, what to pull out, what, it, what to say to the teacher, how to um, uh, reintroduce vocabulary from the beginning of the unit at the end of the unit, do all the things that professional coherent curriculum requires. And whether you're doing an old 20-pound textbook or beautiful new tablet uh, curriculum, uh, it, you can't just take a bunch of stuff you find on Google and put some metadata around it, string that together, and call it a curriculum. So there's a tradition within the publishing world of how you do content and how you do instruction that's effective, uh, it's, and, and how you engage uh, academic authors. And I think that a lot of value has come out of that, and I hate to see that lost as we rush to um, sort of automatically generated aligned curriculum through the wonders of metadata. So there's, uh, there's more to the big publishers than just the textbooks, and uh, I think we all know that, and that's why we're uh, uh, in this business. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating time, and. Uh, uh, if anybody is acutely aware of all of the changes, the threats and the opportunities, it's the, the companies that live and breathe it every day. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there'll be a um, uh, lot of parts going away, but lot, lots of uh, new parts popping up to take their place. So the question, why, why am I bullish on K-12? Um, so I think I would start globally um, mm -hmm. and say that enough data has been out there now, there's enough realization that uh, early education is the economic engine of a nation. Um, and clearly we have disparities within nations between haves and have-nots across nations as a competitive, uh, uh, a competitive issue. And I think more and more we're also starting to see the skills gaps um, from what uh, education is preparing kids for towards what employers are looking for. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of a, a desire for an alignment and a shift from education departments to labor departments being interested in the education system. I think over the next 15 years, we're expecting about 3 billion people on the planet to move from pover poverty to middle class. Uh, they're going to be demanding better forms of, mm -hmm. of education. I think there are great global opportunities there. Um, I think with respect to um, uh, U.S., uh, um, I do think Common Core is a game changer. We're going to see... Uh, we're going to see new modal and, and really Common Core as a proxy for uh, a shift towards what does college and career readiness mean? How are we actually going to get our kids prepared? What we have been doing, even if succeeding is not succeeding for our kids, I think that will fundamentally change uh, some of the paradigms for teaching, learning, and assessment. And assessment will really drive uh, how much teaching and learning uh, um, is, is, uh, is actually changed. And then I think uh, the, the technology trends, and you know, Moore talk, you know, talked about it years ago in terms of processing power. Um, I think we're seeing it now in terms of cost and access and internet. Mm -hmm. I think we are, um, let's put it this way, we're getting to a point where a publisher like us is willing to invest um, what we used to and more for all digital 
programs and content, assuming that kids will have access to it. Mm -hmm. To me, I think that's a major tipping point. That means it's time uh, to invest, especially if you're a smaller company, um, that the future uh, will be there for, uh, for um, digital, uh, digital opportunities. And I would just end again with outcomes um, that uh, there's absolutely an opportunity to, uh, to, to step up and become outcomes partners in efficacy with, uh, with customers and in need. So that's why I'm bullish. Great. I'm going to turn it over to the audience now. Um, we assembled an awesome panel for you. They're smart. They're experienced. They tend to speak their minds. Um, there are microphones out there, so if you don't mind, um, you kind of queue up at a microphone, and uh, if you could just give you real quick who you are and where you're from, and, and, and arm wrestle over the microphone if necessary. Um, I'll leave, turn it over to you. I think you have the usual suspects at this microphone, Robert. Uh, question about funding. On one hand, you have the transition to digital, the need to a whole bunch of new materials, common core requiring new materials. Yet on the money side, as Bob mentioned at the very beginning, uh, you have the effects of sequestration. You have uncertainty about ongoing federal and state funding. How has that changed how you think about bringing new products to market and how you sell them? So can we break that into two parts? One, the overall lethargy in the funding environment, but also this you know, as you switch into digital solutions, actually there's a lot of buyers who have to come together, a lot of budgets that have to come together. You move to different pricing models as well. So I'd be curious both the overall, but then some of the micro parts of how you have to price and negotiate. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just in D.C. and had the opportunity to chat with um, Jeb Bush on this topic, and we were talking about kind of what would be one or two of those levers that you would like to see pulled. And I think the lever that is really preventing a lot of the story that we are hearing from becoming a reality is the way that we think about content acquisition mm -hmm. and the funding for that content acquisition in these chunks of time. So I want to be able to go to a customer and say, you will never have to deal with an adoption again. I am going to be able to provide you with a solution that adoptions are no longer your reality. And that would truly start to get us to a place where we see the power of digital content being realized in the classroom. However, from a funding perspective, they are still thinking, wow, I only got so much money this year, and I don't know if I'm going to have it next year. So I, you know, I got I to gotta think differently about how I'm going to distribute those funds and how I'm going to acquire content and where I'm going to get the money to pay for it. Until we can see in baseline funding mechanisms um, the opportunity for folks to make procurement decisions for content year after year after year on a consistent basis, it's going to be a lever that pre prevents us from, I believe, truly delivering on some of the things that we're all talking about. And, and as, an, as a nation, I think that that's one of the things that we have to have more focus on from, from a reform perspective. It's interesting. I, I, you know, we, we're doing research with the district about pricing models, and I think it was summarized to me best by chief academic author said, so I really like the SAS pricing model. It's just that I have enough money right now, I want to buy five years' worth. <laughs> so, so that's a good point. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad point. The issue isn't necessarily the funding mechanisms, although I could argue I'd be perfectly happy and um, I would be economically less advantaged if they went to an annual subscription as opposed to giving me six years at once. But the issue is more around the adoption process and the evaluation of content. If adoption committees would embrace the idea that we want to be your partner and constantly improve the content, which means we're going to change every single learning object that isn't working every time we identify it's not working, mm -hmm. you know, and not require us like some states would to have every time we do that go back to a committee, which only meets once every seven years, you know, that's where it's broken. It's not broken per se in the funding model because I'm happy to take six years up front. I just locked in, you know, a six-year SAS agreement, and that's really good for me. Good for all you guys, too. Cash flow, six years up front, you know, you can pay all your bills. If they went to an annual model, it'd be okay. Wouldn't be as profitable, but it'd be okay. But it's really about the adoption process more than it is the funding model that I think is driving But those challenge. two things are so tied together. They right? don't have to be, though. They don't. But, I mean, from a reality perspective today, they're just so intrinsically linked. I think that the mindset is, the mindset is that they are... That, you can't change one without the other. And I, I agree that that probably will be the case, but it doesn't yeah. have to be the case. Agree. Completely right. agree. Yeah. So just, just one data point that I contested here. Um, we just actually were approved in California for what I think is the first complete digital curriculum with no print. 
and I, I, I believe that's, that is uh, the first and unique. But to your point, um, uh, even the, the submission process uh, was something that they needed to gear up to understand um, how do you how do you look at an interactive, you know, print it out so that the uh, so that the, the committee can review it, um, and this notion of changing. So in a SAS model, exactly, it's continuous improvement, but uh, we're going to have to be very careful, like what is the degree of what we can change. Um, so I think we're starting. Um, I think you've identified the, uh, the challenges. Now, now, that is a little bit of a separate discussion from, from the funding and whether it's a, you know, a scorched earth policy of I have it now and I need to spend it or not. Um, but I do think we're going to see more adoptions um, uh, get geared up to, to be able to evaluate all digital. So over a decade ago, Tom Carroll wrote an interesting piece that asked the question, if we didn't have the schools we have today, would we create the schools we have today? <laughs> so I'd like to paraphrase that question with respect to content. If we didn't have the content we have today, structured in most cases linearly, uh, divided into basal and supplemental categories, if we didn't have the distribution models and the business models, adoption processes, and so, et cetera, that we have today, if you could create content, distribution models, business models, without those constraints, what would you do? You know, this idea of smart content, I think, is, from a teacher's perspective, very advantageous. I, I want my content provider to improve its content based upon the experience that I had with it. That simple sentence, everybody kind of nods their head, yeah, that, that sounds really great. But the reality of doing that and all those things that you said if I didn't have to worry about, I do have to worry about. And so that prevents that from happening right now. But that idea of based upon what I've learned, the data exhaust that we're getting from the content experiences that our kids are having, and me being able to change that and improve it and provide a, a, a consistent um, improvement of experience over a course of time, that's what I think content should look like in this country. And from a technical perspective, we can do it. There is no reason from a technical perspective that that is not our reality. All the other reasons are man-made or woman-made. <laughs> I mean, they are, all, they are all created by policy and practice that we have the ability to change if we have the courage to do so. So I think 